more for this regulation. Sile. He had a steam driven charcoal. And he took me with him out to see it working. The men were working it. And I can remember a four gallon tin half full of boiled potatoes. And we ate them out of the skins. And that's about all I can remember of sale. Well, Later on, we moved to Tullamarine, practically where the old Tullamarine air drive, at least Essendon air. Mm -hmm. Well, did he start his married life at sale? That was where that's they settled, right, yeah. the first settlement. My mother was a school teacher. Her first school was at Walhalla, where she was taken in on a pack horse. From so, where? From the end of the road. Oh, yeah. yeah. We went down on a bus. The bus used to go down there some, but the last few miles you had to go in on a pack horse. And where were they married? Oh, well, she was teaching a sail. And just from conversations I heard, he was very keen to get married and she wasn't, and he cleared off to Western Australia. Yeah, yeah in a half. Oh. You know the word. Mm -hmm. And they came back again, of course. And somewhere about that time they got married, but I couldn't tell you the exact well, time could be. No, but they out. were married at sale. At sale, yeah. At Ford. Or was that where you used to live? Well, she was brought up with her uncle and aunt, the Reverend Ernest Smith. And I presume she'd be, she actually would be married from there on. Right. And that they lived at sale. They started their married life at sale, but they were married in Melbourne. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then... Well, how long did you live at sale? Oh, I would be about four and a half or five when we left sale. Mm -hmm. I was born in 1999. And I can remember them saying <coughs> the house had a, had a mud floor, that big rock. Just a dirt floor. Yes, the kitchen would have, mm -hmm. yeah. And we moved to Tullamarine. We lived in the schoolhouse, school residence, because it wasn't occupied. We bought a piece of land on the other side of the road and had bought a house to shift onto it. And we lived in that school residence until the house was shifted there. Mm -hmm. I think um, Stan and Ivy would both be born at Essendon. It was those days you remember, or you don't remember, but uh, the lady, a midwife, would come along and bring a few cases and things. And mm -hmm. One of these cases always contained a baby. <laughs> when, the woman, when the woman left behind, yeah, that was where the baby came from. Yeah, yeah. But um, from there, we moved up to the Golden Valley, out between you and Mike and Catamatite. Him and his brothers, Bert, Ben, and Joe, all moved up there in about the one year onto the land. And things weren't very good in those days. There were drought years. Nearly all the sheep died, but there were thrashing machine days. All the, most of the harvest was done with thrashing machines. The three brothers left there, Fred and Bert and Ben. Joe stayed there. We moved down to Coynton. He leased a big property at Coynton. What about your schooling? When did you start that from your mother's well, teaching? I did you start or? school at Tullamarine, five and a half. Mm -hmm. You actually went to school. Went to Grandma school. didn't just teach and you. So did Frida. She went to school. And then when we got to the Golden Valley, there were two schools. We were halfway between you and my west, or you and my north and Catandra west. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> mother being a dedicated school teacher, we were transferred from whichever school had the best teacher. Mm -hmm. If the, you and my one was 
They're doing the jobless one over to the other. They're three yeah. miles either way. How many times did the swing over take place? Oh, I don't know. Well, quite a few times. We were going to the Katanda West School when it was rebuilt, a new school was built. And a Miss Johns was teaching there. She married a Harry Beatty. And I think they spent their entire life there. The names are still there. But Frida and I went back to that school a few years ago and got our photos taken in front of the blackboard. The blackboard is still there. It's a, it's a complex now. There's half a dozen schools right. in the one yard. That, that building is still there. Mm -hmm. And when we left there... How many years would you have been farming in that area? Oh, I might have been there for three years, I suppose. Mm -hmm. From there you went to Kyneton. From there he leased this big place at Kyneton, 1,500 acres, and went in for a sheep nearly. We travelled down there, we went, Stan and I went in the three-seated buggy. One of you had two men working for him then, and they went on in a horse and gig, and leading another couple of horses. We camped the first night at Arcadia with some relatives. The second night we camped at a hotel on Hughes's Creek near Mangalore. The third night we thought we were going to get right through to Langley Park, that is the name of the place. And we left Lansfield, it was raining and we were heading up into the bush. We were on, entirely on the wrong road. After a after it got dark, we turned round and drove back into Lansfield and stayed at a hotel and they gave us some tea and chaff for the horses. And we headed off again the next day with a sheet of oil cloth to keep the rain off us. It was raining all the time. And uh, we called at a woman's place asking the way, and I can remember as clear as can be, she said, oh, hell, they're away to blazes. We were entirely on the wrong track. And it was dark that night before we found the property. And how many miles a day would you do? Oh, well, once we got into that hilly country, we didn't do very much. It took us all day to go from Lansfield to Bainton because we were on the wrong road. It was only about eight miles, really. Mm -hmm. We'd gone away around Carl's Railway. Mm -hmm. Well, when you got there, what? There was a house? Uh, oh, it was a good home in that place. A very good home. And the two men were there in residence in the hut. It was a good home there. We got a, a lot of mischief on that place down there. Yeah, well, where were Grandma and the girls? How did they come? They were, and when we used to shift from farm to farm, Mum and the girls, or younger members of the family, used to go and stay with a relative until we were established. This went on several times. Mm -hmm. And then after we'd been established, they'd come by train to the nearest town. Oh, yeah. And that. Case, I'm not sure whether they went to Wood End and stayed with Auntie Lou Adams. And he went over and brought them back. That's only about 12 miles across in June. I think that's what happened that time. Mm. Well, he was sheep dealing then and lost all the money he had. Likewise, Bert and Ben lost everything they had. They were both sheep dealing. Why did they lose? We left there because we had nothing left. But what caused the great loss? Disease or? No, or just or uh, yeah, bad dealing, management? bad dealing. Oh. And a bit of gambling, I suppose, oh, in the sheep yeah. market. Yeah. That, that happened frequently. Yeah. And we went, when we left Langley Park, all we had was a little pony and a chestnut pony and a jinker. He had to sell the two trotting horses he had. He'd already sold the property. He never owned it. Oh, he was only renting it. It's only renting it. And living rather flat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two trotting horses in training and oh, dear. bought a new motorbike and used to go away for a week or two at a time around the sales dealing in sheep. Well, how many children were this time? <clears throat> 
Well, they'd be all there but the last three. That was Laurie and Harm and Merlin. They were all born while we lived at Monument Creek. When you went we? We shifted over to Newell and he went to work for his brother who owned a bacon factory in Newell. I don't know how we'd have gone on if it wasn't for help from our relatives. He was a very good uh, worker and enterprising, but his management wasn't the best. He worked for Tom, his brother Tom at the bacon factory in Newham, possibly for 18 months or so. And then he got word from his brother Bert that he bought into a big property down near Lardner. Too big to handle on his own. And we moved, all moved down there. And uh, that was when one occasion when two families of Newnham tried to live in the one house. Quite impossible. There was more fights and arguments than you. Yes. Uh, we were milking, well the shed we were milking in had two rows of bales, it was all hand milking, eight cows on one side and seven on the other. And you could drive a wagon down between the two and feed the cattle. And one lever bailed up those, all those cows at once. No, Your mother will remember this very well. Because sometimes it could have been myself, be a slow milker down at the far end, and I'd be still milking there, and the, out of sight, and the cows are usually leg rope. And when the side of cows are finished, they were supposed to be let out of the lever. Yeah. Many a time they were let out and there was still one cow with a leg rope on. And you hanging on still to the bed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it used to be comical. And Uncle Bert was very fiery tempered and there was a a flare up over that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, how long did that last? I think about 18 months. Mm -hmm. Under all very adverse circumstances. I don't think there's much money for anybody in it. Anyhow, they separated and we moved about three miles away to a hut near the Lardner the School, a small house near the Lardner the School. And we went trapping rabbits for a living. Grandpa and you are the boys. Yeah, the Stan and I. Yeah. And how old would you be? Oh, I suppose I could have been 11. And, and your schooling finished then, didn't it? Oh, no, no. Yeah. Um, he would take the rabbits into Warrigal and sell them. What would have had to be done every morning, winter time, they could go two or three days. Yeah. And we'd have to go around the traps before we went to school in the morning and hurry to walk to school. And we'd be told where to take our lunch or his dinner after school come out, where the line of traps were to be set, and we'd go on setting traps to light them. Mm. Yeah. And um, go around them at night, about 8 o'clock, and then to bed and walk around them in the morning before school. In those days, the farmer used to supply our horse with chaff or grain as long as we were trapping on their property. Mm. And how much did you get for a pair of rabbits? A, a pair of rabbits then was five pence for a large pair of large rabbits. Oh and to get other than rabbit to eat was quite a luxury to us. Occasionally, he'd come home from Warrigal and bring sausages, and they were a real treat. Mm -hmm. As you know, I don't know whether you knew Grandma very well, did you? I remember Grandma. Mm -hmm. She had quite a battle to keep us fed and clothed. Mm -hmm. well, then we got, things weren't going very well, but we got a letter from Uncle Jim Cook at Rochford near Romsey. He had a sheer dairy farm going and offered the dad the chance to take on this sheer dairy farm. We took a bit of a vote on that, if I remember rightly. We voted in favour of going to this dairy farm. Mm -hmm. 
At that time, we had a, a white pony and a jinka. I don't know where the pony came from. It was a very good pony. And we went to shift there. I'm not quite sure how we shifted. I think we went to this Uncle Owen Smith's and stayed overnight there and then went on by train to Romsey and Uncle Jim took us out to this farm. Well, do you need to shift the furniture from one place to another? Oh, furniture van. That's an interesting story too. When we had to shift, you'd read the daily papers, vans returning from Albury, Sydney, or so forth, and no telephones. But what sort of vans? Two big furniture vans with four horses in each. That's the point. That's the point, yes. Yeah. And they'd write and communicate with them, they'd be there on such and such a day. So then, a week before they were due, the packing up would start. The boxes were used extensively. We always had a big piano which stayed with us all the way. And maybe just when everything was packed up, we would get a letter to say that they're unavoidably delayed and may not be there for another few days. Imagine the confusion there. <laughs> and uh, usually when we drove to the next place, Furniture vans would be there and we'd help unload them and get things into something like ship shape before Mum and the other youngsters came along. Mm -hmm. I'd be missing one or two things. But anyhow, we moved then to Romsey. And that is where the family dispersed from, actually. But I went to school at Tullamarine, you and Mike West, you, you and Mike North and Catandra West. At Langley, we were too far from the school. All 18 months there, we never went to school. Mm -hmm. She did the best she could with us, and it was pretty hard to keep under control mm -hmm. because the place was full of rabbits, and we had a lot of dogs and ferrets, mm -hmm. and we were rather losing. Mm -hmm. She didn't get much of a chance there. But you went back to school. Then we went to New Orleans and went to school. Mm -hmm. New Orleans. New Orleans. Went to school down at Lardner. And I came back and went to school at Lardner Creek. I think that adds up to seven schools. Mm -hmm. Now, how many years would you. What age did you leave school then? Well, I left school officially the day I turned 14. 14. But in the meantime, we'd lost definitely 18 months at, uh, Langley. at Langley. And the school was burnt down while we were going to Lardner School, and we lost a fair bit of time there. And finally, they transferred the school into a hall, and we carried on there for a while. There were two schools were burnt down in the family school. Those of us at and Creek were burnt down, but I wasn't going to school there. Yeah, the, back to the milking. The, the well, Frida, your mother, was the best milker I ever saw. <laughs> yeah, she didn't pass it She on could milk oh, nearly two cows to hour one, and she, she'd milk in the morning, and she was a great dancer later on in the life. And she'd have half the cows milk when we got home from school if, she, if, the, if there was a dance on somewhere. Mm. And walk three miles across to Mount View and they'd take her to a dance from there. Mm. Strangely enough, your father never danced. No. She stopped dancing the day she got married. <laughs> yeah, now. She's been a mainstay of our family all the way through. And still is, I think. I think so. Mm. And there is. <laughs> now, you milked the cows, and that was the main income. Yes, he went in, Dad went very extensively in for poultry while we were there. Really extensively. Hundreds, hundreds of ducks. There we I don't ever remember seeing me. Yeah. And, um, and he got a few chooks and 
to in the egg lying competition to Bendigo. But uh, that collapsed just as suddenly as it started. He sent them all to Melbourne the one day, ordered crates to Romney, and they all went to Melbourne the one day. Consequently, flooded of the market didn't do very much for them. Oh gosh. Yeah, well, then are. that property was sold. People in Holbury sold it. And Jim Warren bought it. And Uncle Tom Rob, that's the mother's only brother, heard about it. And he wrote to Jim Warren and asked him, did he want the property? Jim said no. So I get a bit of moose from that. He didn't want to see the family turn out. So the uncle bought the property and we spent the rest of our life, well, the dad spent the rest of his life on the property. It's a nominal rent. And he cleared it, did a lot of improvement on it, made a much more valuable property out of it. I don't know what would have, how we'd have got on if it wasn't for help from our relatives. Mm. The last latter years it was Uncle Tom that helped. Definitely. Yes. I can remember Uncle Tom. Yeah. Big black car. Yeah. He was a managing director of Mark Foy's in Sydney. Mm -hmm. And we were his only relatives. Mm -hmm. And uh, several times a year, when the money was scarce, there'd be a, a bolt of flannelette come down or dressmaking material or something like that. Mm. He was constantly giving us substantial presents like that. Mm. He thought a lot of us and we thought a lot of him. Now, then the rest of you can go down the ladder. They're Frida, married to the <coughs> Frida married Roy Vinnegan after the First War, yes. Mm -hmm. He, oh, you can get all that from your mother anyway. Yeah, he joined the point. police force, came out of the police force, well, he was a blacksmith first. Mm -hmm. He went to the First War. Came out of the police force and tried his luck at gold prospecting around Ballarat. Mm -hmm. Then he got a job as a uh, Nuisance Inspector or Health Inspector with the Melbourne City Council. Mm -hmm. I forget exactly what it was. At that stage, he got into the social life down there and he admitted he was quite wrong about dancing. He wished he'd learned it. Mm -hmm. He took a different view of it altogether. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And of course, then the Second World War came along and he was quite sure they couldn't win the war without him. Mm -hmm. so he joined the army. Came out of that, his health was considerably impaired and he never really recovered from it actually. Mm -hmm. Well that brings us to you. Get somebody else to talk about. <laughs> but anyway, you've <coughs> lived um, I'm, I'm married in 1926, I think. Uh, Ivy's wedding, I can remember. Yeah, but I'm just out on all the Mallee trekking you did then. Eh? Oh, well, when, when I first left home, at, I went, I, at 16, during the middle of the war, and your family was living. Oh, they were still in Monument Creek. Yeah. Yeah, yes. I worked for three years for Uncle Jim Cook. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from him. Doing what? I was farm boy for a pound a week. A pound a week, yeah. I got paid once a year. Once a year? Once a year. But if I wanted five or ten shillings any time, I had to ask for it, and it was just written down in the book. Yeah, I had 
Yeah, go ahead. Go, here's the keys to die guy. Then you go play once a year. Oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I had two days off the first year, Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Obviously, Christmas Day and Easter Monday, I think it was. Obviously very healthy, you didn't have any days sick. I didn't have time to spend money anyway. No, sick days. You were you were very healthy. Oh yes. You didn't well, have to make any sickies. No, the one occasion when the Spanish influenza was about, I was laid up for a while and they took me into the house. Otherwise, I camped in the hut with another old chap that had been there for most of his working life, I think. He was getting 25 shillings a week, <coughs> and he read quite a large family on that. I met many of them. You will know Doug Pino in Rochester. Yeah. This was his grandfather. He was Doug Pino, too. No, yeah, I think I think he knows because I knew the Jim, his father, Jim. He was one of the family that Doug read on the 25 shillings a week. But I had two days off and I was deducted at the end of the year half a pound a day for those two days. Christmas day and... Although I milked the cows in the morning before I rode the bike home and I came back and milked the two cows in the evening. Oh, so you didn't have a day off at all. Well, the following year I was promoted. I got 25 shillings a week. Jeff named Walter Barber come and took over my job at the pound. Oh. Well, you worked for Jim Cook for three years, so three that made you know I heard. Well, uh, the, ne the next year I got two pounds a week, mm. which is considerably large. That's right. And I got Saturday afternoon all. Mm. The things have progressed. Yeah, of mm. Well, when no. you left there, you would be nine heard, right? I think so, yes. Yeah. And the, war, the war finished while I was there. He had a, an only son, Harvey, who was killed at the war. Mm -hmm. I remember that very well. I could ride the bike around that night and tell all the relatives. Mm -hmm. Not a nice job. And, uh, third year, I got two pounds a year. Well, by that time, I was his main man around him, wasn't anything done. And I did do other work around, a bit of fencing, potato digging, and so forth. But uh, and then I went with Ken McKenzie up to the valley when he got a block after the war was over. And we cut down Mallee, 12 shillings a day. And we split posts with a trellis work around Red Cliffs, and they were taken by boat from the river just near where we were to Red Cliffs for building the trellis for the wines. Mm -hmm. While we were doing this, we were really waiting. We tended for a road job, Ken McKenzie and I, <coughs> for the Majura Shire for 10 miles of clearing the road from the railway line to Calignum on the river <coughs> at the price of 10 shillings and threepence a chain clearing it 40 foot wide and had to grub out all the stumps to a depth of 9 inches. We secured, we were successful in the tent and we got the job and we pulled all those trees out. We finished on the 3rd of January, we worked all Christmas Day and New Year's Day because I don't wish to take it to go back and take the pea thrasher out for the uncle who bought a pea thrasher from America. And I took it out for the season. Where is that? Round Walls. Yeah. And that, uh, that was the first mechanical successful pea threshing that was done. Previously, that it was done by flails, two sticks with a few links in between them. And the man flailed the peas out on a hessian sheet and cleaned them in the wind, for which they got three shillings a bag. That is 30 cents in the present mm -hmm. yeah, Now, yeah. I took that machine out for th three years, I think, for the uncle. Well, that means you finished in the mallet for the time being. Or did you no, just, after, you just we, finished, after we finished the that season. 10 mile job, we moved out to the Millerwall country when I went back. Mm -hmm. 
And as the Millaroa line was built out from Redcliffe towards the South Australian border, 60 miles from Redcliffe to the border, it was 60 miles of Mallee with nobody living in it and no war. And the construction train, as it went out, brought water trucks and kept the water up, up to us and our horse. We had a one horse, a dray, and a hand operated winch for pulling the trees out. And we cleared the road each side of the line, and each mile we cleared it out a mile north or south, so that ran, line was running west. Yeah. Did that light come out? No, it's going. This was just checking. Yeah. Um, for that job, we got three and sixpence a chain. We had to clear it 16 foot six wide, straight through the bare valley. It looked like a tunnel when you finished with it. Now, I, one morning, Monday morning it was, right? Sunday we'd spend sharpening up the axes and things. I'm cutting a bar of velvet soap, just to give you an illustration, with an axe. Velvet soap or homemade soap? No, velvet soap. Mm -hmm. And it snapped off with a bit of a rush and the axe went in me. Mm -hmm. That put me out of action for a while. Mm -hmm. But there was no doctor those days. We just tied it up. I did a bit of cooking and that was very near the job. Nearly finished the job then. Wait a minute, when you say you did a bit of cooking, what would you be cooking? Rabbits? Well, oh, I looked after the camp while that Yeah, I know. Finished. What sort of meal was well, it? Well, once a week, a man in Redcliffe, a storekeeper in Redcliffe, used to put a few things together. There were two or three loaves of bread, a lump of beef, and a few regular items that were put on that construction train. And uh, well, the construction gang used to work in very well with us. They always run off a Trap with some water in it at the loop line so that we could get never into it or water. But as the train went out, they had an idea where we were working, and he would kick that bag out the guard, guard's van door, and the engine driver would blow the whistle. And there were dingoes in that country and a few stray dogs. And we would straight away put our horse in the dray and head for the railway line again. and rescue our tuck. Did they ever beat you? I don't think they ever did. No. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? And um, apart from that, we used to make our own soda bread in the camp oven and had a considerable amount of rice. Dried apples were another mainstay. Mm -hmm. As I say, I got incapacitated at the finish. And there was only two days to go, and, and Ron had moved up to the area. Then Ken had gone back to his farm at Caligman. And Bill McKenzie, his brother, and I and Ron were carrying on with the job. Mm -hmm. So Bill and Ron finished the job, and I travelled back into Redcliffe on the first passenger train to travel on that line. We had ran a back to Redcliffe celebration. I don't know. How it originated because Redfish was that young, there was hardly anybody had left to go back to it. They brought passengers out on that train, it was a hot day, and there were more scorched, sunburned girls going back on that train than you'd see anywhere else. But that wouldn't be uncovered enough to get sunburned in those days, would they? Didn't they still wear long dresses and well, big sunbonnets? And... I know there's a lot of sunburned faces, I know. <laughs> Some of them went out there without hats, I think. <laughs> But anyway, I travelled back in on that train and I booked a bed in Red Clips and put me a tin trunk and over the coat on and I'm wandering around filling in time and a train pulled into Red Clips and I said to the guard, it's a good train, they're loading green peas. I said to the guard, can I go down to Oregon on this train? I had a voucher from the State Rivers to collect a cheque for £300 from their office in Oregon. 
And he said, you watch your own risk, you can travel like you is. I went back and they uh, based me bed. I grabbed my case and overcoat and got back in the guard's van. Another chap came into the guard's van. He was a working fellow, just doing the same as I was, getting a ride down to Redcliffe's. He had no money when we got into the pub at Redcliffe's to pay for his bed. So Muggins let him pay for his bed. He was gone next morning when I got up. I paid for three beds that morning and slept in one. But I... Well, what was the risk on the train? No, it was really no risk. I mean, there was a, a guard's van at the end of a long train of goods truck. There was a, truck. There was a lot of slack. And there were some terrible jerks for the going over the sand hills and grades. Mm. All that slack would be taken. There's no risk, I don't think, but that's how he put it. Yeah. Anyway, I cashed the cheque and went on down to uh, Melbourne. And incidentally, I, all this was going on. I had no bottom teeth, whatever. I took them taken out in Bendigo. But I, all the bread I ate it was hard. I had to put in a cup of tea before I could chew it. And I got measure. Impression taken for a set of teeth while I was in Melbourne. And uh, carrying on from there now. Well, you're on your way back. Time, you finished the big job up This was the second, I think this was the second season. We worked all the winter on those roads. I think this is the second season, taking the, a little bit ahead. By the time I got to Romsey, Burn Cook, that's a friend of mine, had available a job cutting 600 tonnes of chaff down at Red Rock near Sunbury and I had already paid a deposit on the chaff cutting plant, traction engine and chaff cutter one for Jim Cook. So I secured this job of cutting 600 tonnes of chaff. I had no vehicle. And where did you move the chaff cutter? Oh, it was a traction engine used to pull it about. Oh, it's got the meat to travel about. So I scrounged around and a chap named Eric Binnicum, he was a cousin with your father's. Had a motorbike and sidecar, hadn't done anything for a few years in the shed out on Oxford Hall, where then put port later on. So I went out and bought that, towed in me on another bike to Romsey. I worked on that and got it going, and that was my vehicle, the car. With kerosene and petrol and oil about for the job. Do you remember how much you paid for that dog? No, I don't think it was very much. Mm. I couldn't remember. No. It was an Indian chief. Mm. I've got a photograph of it. Mm. And that did me for a couple of years. Yeah. And we went down onto this job at, at Red Rock. Square as a team, a bit short handed for a while. Went into Sunbury one day and found another spare man who carried on. It was after I finished cutting that 600 tonne of it. That must have been just before Christmas because I took out the pea thrasher that year with the same traction. Mm -hmm. And by this time, how old are you? 20? 21. 21. Yeah. I think it could possibly have been about 21. Then you married your first wife. I think I was 26. You were 26 then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I carried on uh, chair farming and straw pressing and chaff cutting and pea threshing. On, on the uncle's death, I'm not sure when, but uh, somewhere a year or so after that, when he died, I bought that threshing machine and operated for several years. Later on, Ron walked from me. But I, by the time I was in my, I suppose, 20 or 3 or 4, in the summertime, I had 30 men working. I had the pea thrasher and the chaff cutter working. Also, I had two gangs of men quarrying stone. I'd taken on a contract with the Shire. 
to put out 500 yards of spores in various parts of the shire at 10 shilling or threepence a yard. I wasn't an experienced quarryman. And one gang I had was two in each gang. They were experienced, but I was finding all the explosives and they were doing the work. And one gang were getting twice as much stone for a packet of jelly night as what the other was. And I bought a Ford one ton truck, which later became the first truck that Cole started his business with. When the things got more than I could handle, I sold it to one of the brothers. And I think Cole was probably the first one I sold something to. Mm -hmm. And the business that the carrying one. Mm -hmm. Later on, I sold the press to Ron. After the war, I sold all my farming machinery to Mervyn. You first started farming where? On Kettle's place, Money Nut. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to grow 600 acres of oats and handle it all in the sheaf. Mm -hmm. That meant it had to be all put in the sheaf and stooped and stacked, mm -hmm. which was a considerable amount of labour. But labour those days was a different thing than today. There were men that knew the job and they wanted the job. And I, most of those men worked very well with me. And I like to see, there's not many of them left now, but I really like to meet up with them if I get a chance. The few that are left. Well, what's their name? Well, one of them is Jack Matthews in the mm -hmm. I think who else? There's not many men. No. <laughs> well, I can remember snooping at Newham. And That's that was right. on your place. Well, I was renting that place, actually. Oh, yes. That belonged to my wife, Elsie. Mm -hmm. Well, she had a half share in it. Yeah, and we lived on that place. That's right. That's right. Now, well, you farmed at Romsey for how many years? Well, I didn't own any farming land in Romsey. I only owned two acres of land. I built one house on it, then I bought another house and shifted on it. One of my men used to live in it. Mm -hmm. well, that would go on until 38 when my first wife died. Mm -hmm. And I left Romsey. Mm -hmm. And you went, where did you go then from there? I went from there. Before that happened, before her death, I had tended for and bought 200 acres at St. Germans, covered in steep walls, and no fence on it, but it was irrigated, irrigable land. I built a two room place on that and lived in a batch for two years, I think. And then I married Elsie Shelton. And we lived on that. And developed it. And I bought another 200 acres, which Laurie owns now. I sold it to him after the second year. Where is that? Over in Atlantis? Where Laurie lives now. Oh, yes. The first place means it was 200 acres at four dollars, four pounds an acre. Mm -hmm. And I built the business place on that. The first part I lived in a mud hut. Now, my only companion in that hut was a snake that used to live underneath it. I got him when I finished. Mm -hmm. I didn't spend many nights there. Mm -hmm. But um, then this 200 acres that Laurie is living in now became available. That was auction. I left Romsey with about 600 pounds, I think. I sold the two houses for 2,000 pounds. Um, and how long did you live at St. Germain's at the close? I've been lazy on you. I went there and so my wife died in 38. Mm -hmm. was buried on Melbourne Cup Day 1938. I'm not sure when I married the second time. I couldn't tell you the date of the second wife's death. By that time, we had Ray and Joan. Mm -hmm. Joan was just an infant. 
And the Berryman family took her mm-hmm. and brought her up. Mm-hmm. And then you were how long uh, down in Dallas? Well, then I sold the place. Figure it, I, I sold the um, Loring his place was a single unit after the Second War, and I sold the 200 acres to Bob Austin as a single unit for the Silver Return Soldiers Commission. And then I went and bought the Ray's Mail. It was 570 acres of unimproved land. While I was there, Ray started school from there, and he started to ride a bike too. I used to put him on the bike and give him a push off, and he'd fall off when he got to school. He hadn't learned to ride a bike. And the kids at school would put him on. And push him on, send him on his way home. Send him on his way home. Well, of course, he didn't take that long to learn to ride a bike, but that's how he started. Anyway, Marge came back with me then for a while. Doris had been housekeeping for me. Marge came back. And it was, I think I was going to buy her a horse or something, and I got the word of this place at Ballandella. And finished up, I bought the place at Ballandella. I don't know where I got the money from. It was 50 acres at a hundred pound an acre. It's a very nice piece of country. And when I had to get Doris back again then, because I couldn't do without it. And um, when Joan got school aid, she came back with us and brought up there and got to school at Bell. I can't, can't give you dates, but I was I turned the, the 570 acres into plain from, from just wasteland, you know, every inch of it was irrigated and check banked. And I was watering the three places with another 10 acre block beside the 50 acres. I was doing all the irrigating on that. I did that for several years and quite enjoyed it. Began to wear down in the finish. I'm probably missing something out along the line, that's what I help it. Yeah, not a bad thing. You want to get the mud bits. I went from Bellandella and you came over to your rail, right? Well, I sold 130 acres off the, that 570 acres. And that gave me a few bob in hand. And I was getting a bit tired of the irrigation. And I was looking for a place as I told the chap I bought it from, I want a place that run about 700 weathers. I wanted a sealed road and permanent water and modern conveniences. Well, he said, well, you've got the lot here. He said, if it won't run a thousand sheep, I'll give it. He didn't give it to me anyway. Well, I spent quite a 10 years of fairly solid work clearing that place and improving it. And by that time I was about finished as far as work goes. 